Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to the first webinar in our series titled Internal Carbon Pricing, Practical Experiences from the Private Sector. The webinar is about to start. Before we get started, we have two housekeeping items to announce. One is on the software's question and answer functionality, and the second is a note from our lawyers. First, this webinar series is designed to be an open, interactive conversation, and participants are invited to submit their questions at any time via the Q&A function in the menu bar at the top or bottom of your screen. Due to time constraints, we will not be able to address every question submitted today. However, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available online. Second, we are required to draw your attention to the following statement, which is being displayed on your screen currently, and I will read it out loud now. Throughout this webinar series, participants shall comply with competition law requirements and shall not enter into any discussion, activity, or conduct that may infringe any applicable competition law. By way of example, participants shall not discuss, communicate, or, in, or exchange any commercially sensitive information, including non-public information relating to prices, marketing and advertising strategy, costs and revenues, strategy in relation to decisions on internal project and values, trading terms and conditions with third parties, including purchasing strategy, terms of supply, trade, or distribution strategy. This applies not only to discussions during formal meetings, but also to informal discussions before, during, and after meetings. Should the meeting discuss matters that contravene competition law requirements, it is the responsibility of participants to notify the moderator who will discontinue the discussion or close the meeting. Many thanks for your attention. Now, we are pleased to welcome and hand it over to Dominic Worry from the World Economic Forum. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this first um, webinar on carbon pricing, the first in a series. Um, as you can see on the screen, my name is Dominic Waray, and I head our public-private partnership here at the World Economic Forum. And we're delighted to co-host this web webinar in partnership with Yale University, um, the World Bank Carbon Pricing Leader Coalition, and our good friends from uh, Royal DSM, who you'll be hearing from more later. Um, just to put this into context, uh, I feel that uh, this particular uh, discussion today really represents this, not only the spirit of the forum for enhanced public-private cooperation, but also our collective need to advance the agenda for action on climate post-Paris, particularly with systemic issues such as carbon pricing, which really do require a high degree of informal iteration between the public, the private, the academic, and the expert sector. That is really the intent of not only today's discussion, but also the seminar series moving forward. I'm particularly pleased to welcome the CS CEO of Royal DSM, Mr. Fika Sijbesma, and his senior leadership team. Not only is Fika leading the company DSM into really aggressive and exciting territory in relation to carbon action, not only on pricing, but also other materials innovations. He's also a member of our International Business Council and the chair of the CEO Climate Leaders Group, which has 79 CEOs and counting, many of which um, you are representing here today. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome you, Faka, and also your team from DSM. Equally delighted to welcome Professor Dan Esty, who's been a wonderful long-term friend of the forum, um, the Yale University Professor, Hill House Professor of Environmental Law and Policy. Welcome, Daniel. We're looking forward to your expert hands in moderating uh, this session, and of course, to welcome all of our dear friends from the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, um, a really innovative, innovative and exciting platform that's brought together the public and the private um, to advance this very, very important agenda. So within that context, um, I'm delighted to hand you over now to Professor Esty, who will moderate us through this discussion. Um, but just to bear in mind that really we're all here as pioneers at the frontier of trying to build the connective tissue between the public, between the private, between the expert sectors to really drive forward systemic change, scale and speed in terms of carbon pricing and what it can help to achieve by 2020 to move forward the climate action agenda. With that, 
I hope we have a wonderful and interesting, exciting debate. I have no doubt that we'll get lots of insight from our team at DSM. And I will hand over to you, Professor Esty, to see us through. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dominic, and thanks to all of you for uh, joining this conversation today. Um, as you've heard, it's going to be uh, an opportunity to dig into the idea of carbon pricing as a way to begin to get serious about the problem of climate change. Uh, and it's a conversation that we'll uh, carry forward this morning uh, in the United States, in the afternoon, in Europe, uh, in the evening in Asia. But not only today, we're going to continue this conversation on a monthly basis out over the rest of the year and very much hope that we will, in the course of those uh, webinars, be able to dig into the details of how carbon pricing works and really to reinforce the efforts of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition that's really bringing this issue of a price signal on the issues that cause the problem of climate change to the fore. Uh, it's been a big year for those who pay attention to climate change. I've been watching this issue since I was part of the U.S. negotiating team that put together the Framework Convention on Climate Change of 1992. Uh, frankly, watched for a good part of the intervening 23 years with some uh, worry that things were not being taken seriously. But as Dominic has pointed out, uh, we have seen in the last uh, six months, uh, in the last year perhaps even more broadly, uh, a real commitment to action. Uh, culminating in the agreement that was reached at the climate change negotiations in Paris in December. And we now have the 2015 Paris Climate Change Accord that commits the nations of the world to real action. And I think beyond that, that Paris Agreement changed in important ways the conversation about climate change uh, that lead into the conversation today. Notably, it has become clear over recent years, and the Paris Accord makes clear, that we cannot rely on national governments alone to get the job of addressing climate change done. We need broader engagement. We need to bring into the conversation uh, people from uh, sub-national jurisdictions, mayors and state governors or provincial leaders. Uh, we need to bring into the conversation private sector CEOs and other executives. Uh, we need to bring into the discussion conversation with uh, community leaders all across the world. And I think the key in all of this is to really move from talk to action. Uh, we need real concrete ways to change behavior, to move us toward a clean energy future, and to decarbonize our planetary approach to economic activity. And that's what we're here to talk about. How do we move to a world where price signals, long time recognized by those in the academic world and those in the policy world as a critical way to shift thinking, to change incentives? How do we bring those to bear in the arena that all of us work in? And uh, from an academic point of view, this is talked about as internalizing externalities uh, and trying to make sure that those that make decisions do so with the full impacts of the choices they're putting forward uh, in mind. Uh, we've seen, and with huge help from the World Bank, uh, hundreds and now thousands of companies commit to a price signal approach to addressing climate change. Uh, we now believe that we've got more than uh, 500 companies that have actually begun the process of putting a price signal in place internally in their own decision making around climate change uh, and particularly putting some kind of a price on carbon and carbon equivalent emissions. And these is, this is being done in a variety of ways. That's what we want to talk about. Our friends at Royal DSM, one of the real leaders in this effort, are going to talk about how they've done it. We're going to try to dig in in the course of the conversation today on the details of that. And we recognize that it's not only companies, but also governments uh, nationally in places like China, uh, subnationally in places like British Columbia. And we'll try over the course of not only today, but the weeks ahead to learn from all of those experiences, all of those uh, efforts. Uh, we've got uh, a, a special opportunity today uh, uh, with the team from Royal DSM to get a, a company that's taken this very seriously, that stepped up to the issue in a big way. Uh, and as you've heard, uh, Vika is the uh, co-chair of our Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition high-level assembly, and that really does give us a special insight. So what, just briefly, is carbon pricing? It's the idea that you should, if not have an actual price on greenhouse gas emissions, you need to have some signal within corporate decision making that helps to change people's choices and steers them towards lower carbon options going forward. And you really, as a more broad matter, are trying to make sure that we're thinking about 
the social cost of carbon. That's what we call the real impacts of the choices we're making. And uh, it's designed in particular to raise uh, consciousness around energy choices and around energy consumption. Uh, again, as I've mentioned, there are many ways that people can approach this. We want to dig into some of those. But we understand that it's critical that people get into the business of putting a price on carbon and refine over time how they're doing it as best practices emerge. So we've got a number of questions today about what carbon pricing is, how it works, how companies get into it, what are the challenges, and that's what we're hoping our friends at Royal DSM will guide us through. Um, we got a number of issues that I know you all who are watching will want to dig into. Uh, we'll get to some of those today. Uh, as Dominic ind indicated, we may not get to all of them today, but we are very eager over the course of this series to uh, get to the kinds of questions uh, and implementation challenges that many of you will have in mind. And our goal really in the best of uh, a combination of a academic institution, Yale, and uh, a practical real world organization like the World Economic Forum is to combine theory and practice. Uh, we're interested not just in thinking about this as an abstract matter, but really concretely. What is it companies need to do? How do they do it? Uh, what, is it need, what is needed in the way of leadership? How do you drive uh, change? Uh, what are the motivations for doing it? What are the expectations you should have? How are the politics gonna play out internally, externally? Uh, and really, what are some of the critical questions that need to be answered about how to implement? What is the scope you should anticipate? How do you design a scheme? How do you execute? Uh, one of the things I'm most focused on and I think is critical is to get beyond talk to action. Uh, one of the joys of that Paris climate conversation in December leading to the agreement was the real focus on solutions. And I think we're adding to that here today by focusing on solutions and the implementation of those uh, commitments that were made and now need to get put into practice in the way of changing behavior. So the format for today's discussion uh, uh, with Royal DSM is that we're going to begin with a leadership uh, comment from uh, uh, Fika Sibizma, who is the CEO. We will then have Geraldine Matchett, who's the CFO of the company and a managing board uh, member, discussing the leadership opportunity that they have seen at Royal DSM and how that's played out. We will then have a, a period of uh, questions that I will ask. And then an opportunity for all of you on the webinar to put your questions into the system, uh, some of which will be uh, open for discussion with our Royal DSM team. Uh, after that, we will shift gears uh, to a second part of the program around implementation. Uh, and in that regard, we've got two additional Royal DSM executives who are here to tell us about how the company has moved this forward. Michael Lambrex, who's the VP for Finance and Business Support, and Frank uh, Fondenbaumann, who is the Director of Operational Excellence and Responsible Care. So two of the executives within the company who've really been on the front lines of bringing uh, the Royal DSM commitment to carbon pricing to the fore. Again, we'll follow uh, their comments with a commitment to uh, uh, some questions that I've uh, been able to put forward, and then some of you in the audience will get your questions asked. With that, I'd like to uh, invite the Royal DSM team to step in uh, and, uh, Fika, would you please uh, tell us about the experience of Royal DSM bringing this uh, idea of carbon pricing into your company strategy? Thank you very much. Thank you very much all for listening in. What I understand are over 300 people from hundreds of companies and organizations uh, calling in at this moment. And I found that astonishing and very rewarding that so many people want to learn from each other because uh, we also, as Royal DSM, want to learn further from you. Thank you very much, Dominic, from the WEF and the support from the WEF. Thank you very much, Dan, the support from Jail. And let me also thank the World Bank and especially the Secretary of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition uh, because we are really making progress here. Let me make a few introduction remarks. Uh, the external world, the internal world about us, and working together on getting this done. Externally, I mean, to address climate change, you can say it is a need, because otherwise that will threaten the world. But like the new climate economy report showed, it is an opportunity as well. I mean, you can grow the economy, you can grow your business whilst addressing climate change. Nevertheless, we are just are going to do it. I mean, Paris, 
for those who didn't notice yet, I think on the call, everybody noticed, but it is, in my opinion, a turning point. It will, in the future, being seen as the moment in time where the world changed. And I think uh, what is happening now is that implementation of, of carbon pricing will further facilitate that. More than 90 countries, of, is almost half of the countries who signed the Paris Treaty, put in their own plans that carbon pricing should facilitate their own transition to meet their Paris targets. So the writing is on the wall. There will be globally in many jurisdictions in the world a price on carbon. Now that means that you can better be prepared for that. Don't, I say sometimes to people, don't come to me in four or five years. Where is this price on carbon coming from influencing our business? I said the writing was on the wall since Paris 2015. And if you don't have one to have, which some people call their own Kodak moment, I mean, better prepare yourself right now uh, for your future. So uh, why are we implementing a price on carbon in the world? I think to unlock the private capital in the world to address climate change. Because with a price on carbon, what we basically do itself, it's not the solution. But by putting a price on carbon, you put addressing climate change into our economic system. And then it means that you don't need to wait to only to companies who want to do good. Uh, automatically, you all need to do good because otherwise it influences your own economics. That is what we want, want to do with a price on, uh, on, on carbon. And therefore, this carbon pricing coalition, this leadership coalition is there. And what we want to do there, we call it broaden, deepen, uh, and align and converge with each other. Broaden, we want to have more and more countries in the world joining, and it's happening. Deepening, we want to have the systems in the different jurisdictions better and better. And we all know Europe has already for a long time a system, but it is not highly effective. How can you make it more effective? And converging, aligning the different systems in the world, like the Canadians and the Californians and the Mexicans are already trying to do today. So a price of carbon, in my opinion, it will come, and the turning point is now. Now, what do we do internally in DSM? Internally, we say we want to reduce our own carbon footprint by reducing our output of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We want to enable the reduction by developing products uh, which uh, makes cars lighter and use sustainable energy so we enable the supply chain and by advocating, reduce, enable, advocate. And advocate is what we do now. And therefore, we introduced uh, 50 euros you can always debate which should be the price on carbon. We took 50 euros, an impactful price, internally. So all our investment proposals and our CFO sitting next to me, Geraldine, uh, will tell you something more about that. Internally, we work as of the world would switch to a 50 euro price on a tonnage of, uh, of carbon. And that changes your investment decision. It changes your mindset. It changes the way we look to implementing renewable energy uh, faster in, in the company. And that's exactly what we want. We as a company want to be fully prepared on that moment which will come soon. Third one, are we alone? No, more and more companies join us. More than 1,000 companies, there are millions of companies in the world, but more than 1,000 companies already are following this example. And that is very um, um, interesting. Also more and more countries. China will most likely go live with a price on carbon next year, has already uh, tested in uh, seven uh, provinces uh, during this year. Uh, but also the Wales Business Council, sustainable development is helping. Uh, the initiatives of the Prince of Wales, we mean business. I mean, all those groups are, are helping uh, to put things in the, in, in the right direction. And of course, we realize a price of carbon need to be realistic, so not too low. Um, otherwise it has no impact um, of course we should be careful not to make it to too much free trade that it becomes a new toy for the financial industry of course we should be careful about carbon leakage although I want to say don't overdo that either there are differences in taxation in countries also in the world and not everybody is moving only to those low tax countries and at the end of the day it should push and drive uh, innovation and therefore, we are working on internally also to have good definitions, good measurements, good reporting, and good control. Because if you don't define it, measure, report, and can control and check it, 
it's nothing. I think it's a turning point in time. And I wish that turning point, I turn over to our CFO, Geraldine, who can tell you something more about what we're doing further concrete. Geraldine. Thank you, Fred. Um, hello, Dan. Uh, hello, Dominique. Thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity to share and to kick off this series on internal carbon pricing. As you said, this is a bit of a journey. Uh, we started the journey and it's nice to be able to uh, give an indication of how we went uh, about doing that. And now from our perspective uh, there, and particularly from my perspective, I very actively support the internal price of carbon uh, for three main reasons. Um, the first one is about organizational dynamics. Uh, what we have seen is that while our sustainability team is very knowledgeable, has been steering us in the right direction, uh, bringing in a lot of outside in, on their own it's very difficult to move the needle. Uh, by introducing a price of carb on carbon, uh, what we have seen is that we have engaged a whole finance function to really step forward and participate uh, in this whole exercise of really quantifying the impact of various sustainable sustainability related aspects, in this case, uh, carbon. So there you already add one stakeholder to the conversation. Uh, then what it has also enabled is for our operational people uh, to get actively involved as well and think further ahead uh, the, about these aspects uh, and not really at the end of a, of a decision on a project, but really bringing it forward uh, and embedding it in the whole dialogue uh, that we're having. And then fourthly, the business, um, what we're seeing is, as, as mentioned by Fiker, uh, we see sustainability as a business driver. Um, so what it also enables is to really lock in all the participants in decision making uh, around this. And we've created in that sense a new common language by really formalizing the concept of uh, an internal price on carbon. So that's the first big uh, difference since we've introduced this. Uh, now, the second one, which is more intuitive, is that obviously it is a cost. Uh, as we've indicated, uh, we firmly believe that a cost on carbon a uh, meaningful cost in carbon uh, will come at some stage. And therefore, it's quite logical to want to de-risk and future-proof uh, our company by taking that fully into account. Uh, so from a quality of decision-making, it's important to take it on board. Now, what we've seen by doing that is that we also generate long-term thinking. Uh, when you look at these aspects, you automatically stretch the horizon uh, that is being focused upon. On. Even if the model always had you know, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, there was a tendency to be a bit short-termist. Now, by embedding this, we have been able to stretch um, the mindset. And on top of that, it has put a really interesting spotlight on the cost of energy, uh, on the cost of um, or an energy savings and the cost and the saving opportunities, uh, but also the different technologies that we can scale up. And it has really embedded those conversations into the project, not as a side conversation or a potential scenario, but truly in our decision making. So really the second aspect is improved uh, quality of decision making. Uh, and the third um, aspect where I'm, I am actively involved in its internal cost of pricing is to provide the full mandate that goes with this element of our decision making. I think it's very helpful uh, for the finance function to see clear leadership from the top that this is not uh, uh, a simulation that we're adding on top, but it is a true part of the way that we want to drive our decision making, uh, that it is part of all the ratios that we will be looking at going forward uh, and is therefore systematically now in our calculations uh, and in the way that we look at, at future investments. And it's not only important because it gives a mandate to all my finance colleagues to get engaged in this conversation, but it also sets the tone for all the others in the organization to consider this cost in an equal way to all other aspects and that we would consider uh, when making investments. And we've started with uh, investment, uh, capital investments mainly, uh, but it is most likely that we will take this beyond looking at innovation projects, looking at M&A uh, as we follow our journey. But as you said, you have to start somewhere and we started with uh, capital investments. Um, well, thank you both very much. If Geraldine and I could just push you a little bit more about um, how the Royal DSM carbon price evolved. Um, uh, how did the idea come up um, what was the thinking in terms of how you launched it? And, and can you tell us a little bit more about where you think it's going to go? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Um, it's a, a relatively new journey in the formalization. Uh, the it journey went quite fast. So from the concept of joining the UN Global Compact um, to us embedding it in our policy was less than a year. Uh, what we did is that we tested the concept uh, on a few pilots, uh, actually projects that had already taken place, to see how it would have influenced our decision making. Uh, and in that sense, we were able to introduce it. So as Faika mentioned, we introduced a 50 euro per ton uh, price uh, in order to have that meaningful effect. And we determined that from an empirical um, basis. Uh, and with that, we are now taking it, um, taking it forward. Can I just press you a little bit more um, at a very high level about the uh, how that internal carbon price works? Um, what exactly is the mechanism for making it uh, real in company decision making? Yeah. So what we do is for all uh, projects that require corporate approval, what we ask the business teams to do is to put forward uh, what I would call the standard model. That model includes a price on carbon in the jurisdiction where it exists at the actual cost. And we ask them to do the same model, but with this 50 euro per ton price that we embed from day one uh, across, the, across the horizon of forecasted cash flows, if you want, that we put behind that. So what it does is that it's a highlights the impact of this aspect of our project um, and it also creates a platform upon which we then encourage the business to come up with potentially alternatives alternatives from an energy saving point of view from a greenhouse gas emission point of view uh, from a duration and what we're really trying to do is ensure that we are not making decisions today that we would regret when the price of carbon comes up uh, so it's a, it's a pretty uh, pragmatic way. Uh, what we have decided to do, and Micah, whom you will hear later uh, from, was involved in the projects. And um, there we have decided to take a rather simple approach. So, for example, we've decided not to inflation adjust. Uh, we took 50 across uh, the durations. We have tried to stick with the normal discounting approach, which a lot of people are now questioning because it does really take away the impact of future uh, issues when you bring them to today it, it lowers their impact which can be dangerous we decided to take one price across all geographies um, these are all topics that um, the companies listening today will have to take a view on uh, we for the sake of moving now rather than trying to be particularly sophisticated, went for a very straightforward, understandable uh, method to create the platform to have the conversation. So if I, can, if I can switch to you for a moment and ask you, thinking as the CEO in a strategic leadership role, um, how does this internal carbon price um, support the company's emissions reductions, efforts and targets? And I guess even more broadly, how does this uh, align with your broader uh, sustainability strategy and, and corporate strategy for ongoing success? Right. We have, as a company, all kinds of targets in terms of greenhouse gas reduction, renewable energy, and those kinds of things, like many companies have. We say, for example, by 2025, we need to have reduced our greenhouse gas uh, or improved our greenhouse gas efficiency with 45%. We need to re improve our energy efficiency with at least 1% per year. We want to have much more than 50% of our total portfolio of products being eco plus, meaning have a lesser environmental footprint than mainstream uh, products. We want to have 50%, but there's on 25, 50% of our uh, energy uh, being renewable. That is targets the company works for. We need money and investments for doing that. And sometimes you struggle indeed with, uh, we need to do that, we need to invest to achieve our targets, but is it financially also rewarding? The moment you put a price on carbon, it becomes more financially rewarding. You can say, but you don't have to pay that price on carbon. So this is a fake calculation. You can also say, no, this is a calculation preparing on the future, which is, Shorter buy, then further away, so better prepare now. And those companies who will be prepared, I believe, on that future uh, will make it in the future. So it's helping those investments and the thinking about those pro, um, uh, opportunities internally. So I see it as a 
big, big help in the company. So now we're going to turn to some questions that are coming in from the participants in the webinar. And uh, Geraldine, this first one may go to you because you've already started to talk about it. But what are the main benefits to your organization uh, that you see in adopting the internal price? If you can just quickly highlight those again for us. Yeah, indeed. So as I tried to sort of summarize a bit in my opening statement, the really the main benefit is to embed the consideration of the price on carbon into the general conversation in a very systematic way within the company, that it becomes part of our language in the same way as we would talk about any other embedded cost in our projects. Um, so that is the biggest advantage. Um, but also, I see it from a more selfish CFO point of view. It is a great tool to engage your finance function in stepping forward and having the mandate to discuss when looking at the performance of the business, decisions we're making, to take into account sustainability considerations. Um, and that is sometimes not that obvious uh, in some cultures to do that. So these are the two big benefits that I see at this stage. Um, thank you. If I can, again, if I can ask you um, a question coming in that I'm sure many of the companies uh, on this webinar will have is, how did you, uh, from the very top of the organization, engage your executive team? Uh, how did you make sure people thought this was, um, I mean, obviously the CEO, you can tell people it's important, but it, there must be more to it than that. And, and do you have advice for other CEOs about how to bring the team along and how to operationalize this commitment? Well, you said you're obviously the CEO. Um, as the CEO, you can force maybe people to do things. You cannot force people to believe things. Uh, and I think in order to get this done in the company, uh, we don't need to do only things. We need people to believe in things and therefore do things. And it starts with the belief where the climate change is real. And we had a lot of external speakers coming into our company telling about this, telling about the scientific data and the scientific facts, but also telling about the effects. Um, uh, we work together with the UN, the World Food Program, etc. Myself, but I think over time, more than 100 people in our company from high level, from low level, have visited Bangladesh, have visited Somalia, the Horn of Africa, etc., and came back with stories that in certain parts of the world, uh, climate change is not a future problem. Climate change is a problem which they are ready today. People that cannot grow their own food, etc. So the first issue is, is climate change real? And I think deeply in our company, people believe climate change is real. Then the second question comes up, whose problem is that? And we have had that sometimes and with some investors. Many investors support this, by the way. But some investors ask the question, is that not a topic to be solved by governments? And I ask the people, do you really think it is a problem? By the way, do you have children? And do you care about the next generation? Yeah, but let's the government solve it. Do you think governments are able to solve this by themselves alone? And many people come to the conclusion, most likely not. We need the help of the private sector. So here we are. And if you believe that climate change is real, and many people in our company now believe that, and if you believe that this is a responsibility for a broader group than only governments or NGOs, then automatically you start to be involved. And then we have had many meetings internally, many discussions, many debates, many opening and closings of meetings discussing this. And the fun, not the fun, the ironical, ironical part is that nowadays with some people in our company, I'm invited also for conferences and actions which have to do with the mitigation, of not the mitigation, the adaptation um, on climate change. Because now, now there's so many flooding in Europe, uh, so many issues. And the more we talk about adaptation on climate change, we more realize what we're doing and we should mitigate that climate change even more over. And I think more and more people in our company believe that that needs to be done. And once again, I can maybe sometimes force people what to do, but I'd rather have the people in the company believe in it. Uh, that's a very helpful uh, note, perhaps, to close this part of our conversation on. Uh, we're going to switch gears now to the implementation element uh, of this conversation. Uh, we'll be bringing uh, Micah and Frank on to uh, carry that part of the conversation forward. But let me just say, I think this was enormously useful. 
uh, in clarifying that the first step, of course, is to understand the reality of the problem, the scope of the problem, and the urgency uh, of climate change. Uh, I think the fact that there is a price on carbon coming really in every jurisdiction in one form or another, you've made very clear. Um, both of you have also uh, stressed, and I think it is an important point, um, that progress here can't be done by governments alone, that the private sector is going to be part of the solution. I think that is the spirit of that Paris Agreement, broader engagement uh, on how the world is going to get uh, moving forward. And I think a couple of other points that you stressed that I hope everyone is taking home. Uh, one is the importance of finance uh, and a role of pricing and really understanding that the CFO maybe is the key place that this gets driven. Uh, and finally, that it's a journey. But Fike, it looks like you want to offer a, a closing thought, please. Correct. I would like to thank all people uh, because Geraldine and myself will switch off and hand over to the other executives in the company. I want to thank everybody uh, on the call uh, to really to share this with each other. I think this is so essential that the world community is working this so, um, uh, out together. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, World Bank, of helping all of this and all the different NGOs like the World Business Council, we mean business being involved. I think it's so powerful if we as a business community, together with all kinds of involved groups, are working on this topic. Uh, I feel really humble uh, by having so many people being interested in this. And as DSM, Geraldine and I just shared our thoughts. A lot to be learned also for us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you both for sharing your experience. This is, as Geraldine has stressed, a journey, uh, and we are going to need to learn together from it. So that's the next part of our, our program. Uh, we're going to now think about uh, how Royal DSM has carried this idea of a carbon price uh, into uh, its actions on the ground, how it's using it to change incentives, change behavior. Uh, and for that part of the conversation, as I mentioned, we have uh, Micah and Frank. Uh, Micah, maybe I can get you to start um, and tell us a little bit how you were able to align your colleagues around the idea uh, of having an internal carbon price and what it took to uh, pull people together uh, and get the kind of broad-based agreement that, uh, as uh, Fike has pointed out, a CEO can order but not really get people to deliver on if they don't believe in it. So how did you move this all forward? Okay, thanks for uh, having us here uh, today. Um, it's great to share some of our experiences. Um, my experience with uh, sustainability started three years ago when I joined the A4S initiative by the Prince of Wales. And that's where I also got involved with other disciplines. So it starts with involving people from operations, people from sustainability, and people from finance, because uh, it's indeed true what Geraldine explained to us, that um, people from finance were, although they were very supportive about sustainability, they were not fully into the discussion till a couple of years ago. So uh, for me, it started by engaging to other functions. And um, when we uh, finally took the decision uh, to... Uh, become a carbon price champion. Uh, it was not about what, should we do it, but everybody was already aligned that it was a no-brainer and we immediately jumped into how to do it. Um, Frank, can you step in and tell us a little bit about how um, you see the perspective uh, of the Royal DSM effort and uh, what your group has uh, had brought to this conversation? Yes, Dan, uh, I can. And um, it was started already for me years and years ago. And it started with uh, a genuine care for people. And in my view, if you care for people, you also care for the planet. And um, yeah, that, that's, my, uh, that's my passion. And I think that's very much aligned with, uh, with our company values. Uh, I also see that when I visit plants, I work in operations, so I regularly visit plants. I talk with the operators, I talk with the customer service associates. And what I see there is that people are really very pride on what they see our corporation doing, uh, striving to uh, have a positive impact on our planet. And uh, it makes them pride. They can share their stories with the family. They can share their stories with the friends. And it gives a very um, pride feeling for them. And then my role in this, um, in this journey is that I um, am Director of Operational Excellence and Responsible Care. And I steer and guide the operations community, but also the safety, health, and environment community in their journey to achieve our company targets. 
uh, for greenhouse gas uh, reduction, for energy reduction. Um, and yeah, what we would like to do, of course, is select the right projects uh, to improve our efficiencies. But not only that, we also would like to improve, and that's what our department is doing, what I'm doing is improving the skills and capabilities of our people with respect to environmental performance. Micah, um, can I get you just to talk a little bit more about how the enthusiasm got built? Uh, Frank has indicated that um, one of the things is just pride of the workers. Um, but is there or were there some champions within the company who really pushed and led the effort uh, that got the momentum going? I think we have many champions in the company, uh, different functions, different disciplines, and now uh, finance is onboarding into this journey. And when I had to explain to my finance colleagues, um, they immediately saw that internal carbon pricing uh, supports our ambitions in reducing greenhouse gas. So they see this as a mechanism to uh, implement our targets in a financially sound and optimal way. So that resonates with our finance people. And the other argument that's also very uh, uh, important to financial people, they are more uh, risk averse, uh, is that they, um, the de-risking of our business portfolio. Eh? So we are actually preparing our business um, what will happen if external carbon pricing is going to be implemented? And it triggers a lot of discussions, a lot of scenario thinking. Uh, and we communicated that inside the financial community, but also outside the financial community. So that is very helpful. And I think it really will be a lesson to many other companies that if you get the finance group on board, uh, you maybe have the most skeptical department uh, now championing, and that's obviously a very good thing, but the risk logic is a good way to get them there, and, and that strikes me as uh, absolutely right. Um, Frank, can we move a little bit to um, how your department helped lay the foundation uh, for the company commitment? We heard a little earlier from Geraldine um, that you decided on a fixed price uh, across all geographies uh, and, and not changing over time. But how did you decide on that 50 uh, euro per ton uh, price? A and how did you think about what the scope would be? Is it, uh, again, using uh, the terms of art, uh, scope one, scope two, scope three coverage? Um, how did you process that to come to the, the game plan that you've now got in place? Yeah. Very good question, Dan. Um, what, we, uh, what we did, as Geraldine already said, is we took a, a few uh, investment projects that we have been doing and we uh, made some calculations with different price levels. Um, and it appeared that the 50 euros per ton exactly fits our purpose and that's to create a, a mindset in our organization that you start thinking about uh, investments in technology that reduce your, uh, your environmental footprint, uh, reduce energy consumption. Um, so. What that means is that the mindset for operations people, the mindset for engineers becomes such that they start thinking upfront about, hey, in which kind of low carbon technologies, in which kind of uh, best available technologies can I already invest and put that already in the upfront uh, business case. The, um, the other role we had is to um, uh, look at our specific energy uh, projects and what we see there is that the 50 euros per ton uh, yeah, lowers a bit the hurdle of doing those investments. Eh? And an investment could typically be a replacement of a, uh, of a, of a pump uh, by a newer type, lower energy. And yeah, this 50 euros per ton uh, yeah, lowers down the hurdle so that we can uh, have a, a quicker implementation of those projects also. But again, it's about the mindset of the people in operations, the engineers that are truly being impacted by this, uh, by this 50 euro per ton. Well, I'm interested to hear that in my work uh, and, and research across hundreds of companies as they think about sustainability, uh, you put the, your finger on the group that I often find is the biggest obstacle, which is the engineers. Very practical, very rational, uh, focused on operations, very acutely aware of trade-offs. So I guess after you've uh, won the finance team over at the high level, uh, getting that operational crew behind the effort is, is quite critical. Um, so let's yeah. turn to uh, another question. Um, uh, one that has come in uh, that I think a lot of people are interested in, and, and Micah, maybe this is for you, but could you give us an example of where the internal carbon price helped change the decision process and perhaps led to a different outcome 
uh, in something that Royal DSM was making a choice about. Yeah, by integrating uh, sustainability and specifically carbon pricing uh, uh, really into our decision making, um, it's it's equally getting getting equally important uh, for investments uh, um, next to strategic fit and financial attractiveness. So by having that into the decision, um, it was already helpful in several discussions we had over the last couple of months in uh, renewable energy projects. And besides, I think having carbon pricing will guide future decisions um, because a lot of the projects, they are, um, when they only, when they come to corporate, uh, it's relatively late in, in the project. So the key is to influence decision making early in the project phase where you really can still make fundamental choices on technology and the like. So by implementing carbon pricing now, we are influencing the projects that will ask, uh, require corporate approval in the period to come. So Mike, let me press you if I can just a little bit more about that. Um, as you have been rolling this out and as you have seen the actual impacts in decision making, um, have you learned anything uh, in terms of uh, uh, what works and what doesn't? Were there obstacles you had to overcome uh, and are there challenges ahead as you push this uh, to the next level? Yeah, before you, is, when you implement it, you have to really be uh, clear on definitions and how to measure it. Eh? Um, you don't want to have discussions on that. So we really agreed upon what to include, what not to include. Um, overall, our, uh, what worked very well is to keep things simple. And also to reduce the workload for our businesses, keep things simple, integrate it into our, your regular uh, uh, decision processes. So it's not something you do on the sideline. And um, thirdly, I would say, um, don't go for perfection. Uh, so an accuracy of 100% is not needed to have the right discussion at the table. That's very helpful. And I think always the case is you're breaking new ground and, and recognizing that this is a journey. Uh, perfection can't be the goal. Uh, getting up and running uh, and learning as you go makes a, a great deal of sense. So uh, that's enormously helpful. Frank, anything that you would like to add um, as you think about what you've learned and, and how your group has processed uh, the way this is all unfolded uh, in terms of advice to other companies about how to operationalize a, a carbon price in one form or another? Um, yes, um, well, actually in line with what Mike has said, we really like it to keep it simple. Uh, as said, it's not about developing all kinds of conceptual models, it's about really embedding it in the organization, embedding it in the mindset of the people, uh, to make it happen. So, uh, yeah, advice, keep it simple. Definitions, for sure, very important. Else you get all kinds of discussions about data, uh, and we don't want to have that. We want to have content discussions uh, and not about how we get to the data. And then thirdly, as I said, um, and you also mentioned that about uh, the engineers, the people in operations, they really have to change their mindset in, in, in looking forward and in applying the best available technologies. One other related question. Uh, you, you've mentioned that investing in renewable energy was one of the places that uh, the carbon price helped change behavior. Uh, has it also changed uh, company thinking around opportunities for energy efficiency? Oh, absolutely. Uh, because it's an um, additional uh, financial um, um, yeah, instrument to, to make visible what we can achieve by, uh, by doing energy reductions. And uh, absolutely, it helped uh, very much, actually. And um, is there a way that uh, you've been able to signal um, that to those decision makers? Is, there, is it the price itself or, or how has this flowed through the organization to get those kind of uh, uh, focuses uh, changed to bring energy efficiency into decision making and, and more broadly, uh, energy awareness? Um. At the highest level, uh, um, when we make investment decisions, carbon pricing is being discussed. So uh, people are aware of it, they realize it, and they are um, preparing themselves for that. Um, 
And in order to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we, we, on one hand, we are looking at our existing operations. And as you might know, uh, adjusting your existing operations is not always so easy. So probably it's more efficient to focus your effort on your new investments. And uh, this is now very clear in the company. So we do both. Eh? We both look at uh, existing operations, but bring it much more further by focusing on new investments. So we've got a related question coming in from the audience, and that is, um, how did you guys communicate this price signal to the decision makers across the company who had to begin to uh, factor it into their thinking? Yeah. yeah, I think uh, um, the finance discipline played a good role there. Uh, um, it's communicated uh, through the business leaders as well as the finance community. And they are very much aware um, that they have a role to play now. Uh, and they have the means now, like Geraldine explained, uh, they have a mandate to start that discussion. Um, so, and they are the ones that prepare the business cases for us. So, um, and next to that, we also um, started a discussion with the finance people from corporate who do some of the evaluations that they should also uh, look into more sustainability elements. And so if they start asking questions about it, then the ball starts rolling and that's what is currently happening happening at Royal DSM. So another question is coming in is, given all that you've um, now been able to do and your efforts uh, have moved forward, um, are you thinking about any refinements or changes in how this uh, works within the company in terms of the carbon pricing structure? Uh, from an operations perspective, at this moment, not. Um, our biggest uh, challenge will be to be involved in the design of the equipment, where we can make decisions about technology being used. Uh, that's where we have the most impact in our uh, yeah, energy reduction efforts. Um, so from operations perspective, we don't think about refining the scheme. Uh, no, we would like it to keep it simple um, in, in applying this uh, methodology. Well, I suppose the simplicity of the scheme helps um, in that communications as well. It get, allows people to get their minds around what you're trying to do. Absolutely, because you want to do it from uh, top down, but also bottoms up. I uh, would like to have our operators knowing that we would like to invest in our environmental performance. And then a simple explanation always helps uh, them. Yeah, can maybe add anything? From, a, from my point of view, one of the next steps uh, is uh, including it in M&A decisions or M&A analysis, like Geraldine already said, or broaden the scope, um, not only looking into carbon, but look into other elements of sustainability. Yeah? It could be environmental, but can also be more social. So what would be an impact of an investment decision on other sustainability elements? And that's quite a challenge uh, that is still ahead of us. So in fact, um, what you're suggesting, which strikes me as very interesting, is that carbon pricing is the first step in what might be seen as a broader agenda of uh, making sure that all sustainability impacts are factored in an appropriate way. So we might actually imagine uh, an end of externalities more broadly, not just carbon price to address that issue, but uh, really thinking uh, in a bigger way about sustainability. Yeah, that's a next step that we are currently uh, looking at. Well, that's a, a very uh, interesting context to put the carbon pricing um, piece into this. Um, Frank, can I go back to one thing we, we started to talk about, but I realized I didn't push you uh, maybe all the way. You've decided uh, as a practical matter to focus on scope one and scope two emissions. Is that right? And can you tell us a little bit about how you came to that and whether there's any conversation about scope three as, uh, as something you need to focus on in one way or another? Yes, there was a discussion about uh, scope three, but we really would like to focus ourselves on the scope one and scope two, because we also would like to measure the impact of the, uh, the, um, yeah, the instruments we apply. Scope three for us is sometimes a bit difficult to, to, to calculate. There are quite some assumptions being made to get to a scope three uh, footprint. And uh, yeah, there was a, a second argument to, um, yeah, to, to uh, focus on scope one and scope two uh, in our department. Well, it strikes me that you made another important point there, and Micah, maybe you want to pick up on this, but 
it's inevitable that as you try to implement a carbon price, you will have to make some assumptions. You'll have to make some choices. And one of the things I've heard you both say is that uh, you shouldn't uh, bog down on that. Uh, that getting started and making a choice uh, is probably more important in terms of moving things forward. Uh, is that right, Micah, or do you want to add anything to that observation? Yeah, I would like to make one remark on uh, Frank's input. Uh, we limit ourselves to scope one and two, but there, we raise explicit questions when we review the investment proposals on a negative, potential negative impact in uh, scope three. So we don't want uh, greenhouse gas emissions to reduce on the exempts and whereas maybe uh, the impact on the value chains might be negative. So we do raise uh, qualitative questions about that and we expect businesses to come forward so we can have an open discussion about it. Good point. Well, you've made a very important point that we hope uh, not only in today's discussion, we'll get others uh, to come in with questions or comments that uh, reinforce this point that you need to be open, you need to be uh, in many ways uh, committed to this ongoing dialogue and committed to the journey, uh, as Geraldine put it, of, of how to bring this concept of a carbon price forward. Uh, so we're very much hoping that others uh, on the webinar today will share those thoughts, if not uh, in the next few minutes as we close up our conversation today in the coming months as we continue this uh, webinar series. So I am uh, eager to get that conversation uh, opened up more broadly. Uh, and I'm very grateful to what you guys uh, have done in terms of starting the conversation uh, and ensuring that we um, do have the ability with others on the line to discuss uh, both what's been done and how it's worked, uh, what the challenges are and how going forward you uh, expect to address those. And I do think that's the real value uh, of our efforts together. Um, I think we are uh, coming to the end. Uh, I don't know whether uh, either uh, Micah or Frank, you have any last thoughts you want to add, um, but I'm uh, happy to have you make a closing comment before I try to wrap things up. Well, for me, as I said in my introduction, it's all about uh, care for planet and uh, means uh, care for people. And that's the, uh, yeah, the passion we have in our company. And um, yeah, this is, um, Another example of that. I'm looking forward to the other webinars uh, coming from your side. Um, well, thank you both very much. And a, a real thanks to Royal DSM for uh, stepping up to be the first in our series. Uh, we admire what you've done. We're grateful for sharing the perspective that you shared today. Uh, willingness to talk through the issues that uh, were front and center as you brought the carbon price into the organization. Uh, and to recognize, uh, as you've said, that there will be bumps in the road and that people are going to have to keep going despite that. Uh, I think that's really an extremely valuable lesson uh, for all of us as we think about moving us forward. It certainly parallels the experience we've had at Yale, where uh, if we allow the obstacles that emerge to, to obstruct us, uh, we might have given up, but we have persisted and plowed forward. And I think um, uh, thinking together about how to overcome obstacles is an important part of the conversation uh, that we hope to engender over the coming months. Um, it is uh, a real pleasure to have been able to host uh, today's session. Uh, again, a, a real thanks to the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition and the World Bank for its uh, leadership on this. Uh, very pleased to be partnering with the World Economic Forum. Uh, Yale University, as I said, remains internally committed to a carbon pricing scheme. Uh, and as an academic institution, we're especially committed to the learning process uh, and grateful for this webinar as a chance to make that happen. Um, thanks to all of you that have signed in and been part of today's webinar. Uh, we're eager to build a community that is thinking together, working together, sharing experience, uh, and understanding the challenges. And uh, the uh, video of today's um, webinar will be available. Uh, online. So if anyone uh, was not able to catch it or uh, those who were on the conversation feel that others in their organizations would benefit from uh, seeing this uh, dialogue, uh, we will have it up and running uh, in very short order. So again, uh, enormous thanks. Uh, it's exciting to be part of this community that's moving issues forward together. Um, the recordings, as I say, will be available online. We will be announcing shortly the uh, series of webinars going forward and additional topics. Uh, and we encourage all of you to uh, guide us in that process. Tell us what you liked about today's program, what you didn't like, what you'd like to hear more about in the future, and we will try to bring that forward. Uh, so from New Haven, Connecticut, uh, I'm Dan Esty, 
closing out today's webinar on behalf of the organizing committee and thanking all of you for being part of this conversation with a special thanks to our friends at Royal DSM for opening up uh, their company's perspective and giving us the insights they've provided. Thank you all very much. And until next time, we look forward to an online conversation and a live webinar in a month or two. Thanks. <laughs>